Previously on the Philosophical Inquiry Show, Socrates had discovered a solution, a way out of the hard relativism of Protagoras. Socrates found something that he thought was unchangeable, namely the definitions of the words, that is, what corresponds to the essences of things. That's how Socrates was avoiding the hard relativism of Protagoras. Of course, Protagoras' relativism is the scary kind, far scarier than Heraclitus' soft relativism. Heraclitus was simply trying to um, um, set up a, 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 an alternative to Parmenides' theory, according to which our uh, senses are uh, uh, deceived. So, Protagoras was overcome by Socrates. Socrates' student, Plato, what did Plato do? Plato thingified the essences that Socrates was talking about, right? So, Socrates found the essences were stable, that is, the definitions are what has to be stable. Plato comes along and says, but what are the essences? The essences must have a reality unto themselves the so-called world of forms. And Plato gave us a wonderful allegory for understanding the world of forms, the allegory of the cave that I talked about last time. What you and I see as we go through life is but shadows on the wall of a cave. The real essences, the real essences have to be seen not with the physical eyes, but with the intellect, with the light of the intellect, the intellectual eyes, if you will. So, Plato thingified the essences. We call that Plato's theory of forms. Plato's student, who was that? That was Aristotle. You can always remember the three great philosophers of ancient Greece. Spa. Socrates taught Plato. Plato taught Aristotle. Oh, those ancient Greeks must have really loved the spas, huh? So, what is there to say about Plato's student Aristotle. Aristotle studied with Plato for a long time, well into his 20s. And for decades, Aristotle hung out with Plato. He learned all about the theory of forms. And he seems to have, you know, liked it when he was young. He said to Plato, he said, Plato, this is a good theory you got going. We got forms for everything. We got a form of justice. Plato says, that's right, Aristotle. We can study the form of justice. And Aristotle says, we also have the form of beauty, right? Instead of just beautiful things, a beautiful symphony, a beautiful artwork, a beautiful person, we can talk about beauty itself. That's so awesome, Plato. And Plato goes, Aristotle, my boy, it is rocking. It is bitching. Philosophy is about to get going now. Aristotle says, Plato. Even the more mundane things we can talk about, like instead of, you know, that tree and that tree, we know that, that what makes that a tree and what makes that a tree is that they're imitating the real tree, the form of the tree. Plato, it's, it's wonderful what you've come up... Whoa, whoa, whoa! Plato, says Aristotle, I think we got a problem here. Plato says, well, what is it, Aristotle? Aristotle says, Plato, let me get this right. Let me just review the theory one more time here. Plato, did you tell me that uh, the reason this is a tree and this is a tree uh, is because they both imitate the perfect form of the tree? That's what you said, Plato. Yeah, that's right, Aristotle. We call that a tree, and we call that a tree because they're both imitating the perfect form of the tree, just like I talked about in the allegory of the cave. Ah, uh, Plato, I got a question. What gives me the damn right to call this a tree, this a tree, and this a tree? Oh, no problem, Aristotle, says Plato. Uh, there must be some other form of a tree. Just another one down the line here. Uh, it turns out they're all 
imitating this tree up here. That, that, that's it. No, no problem. No problem, Aristotle, says Plato. Whoa, 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 says Aristotle. Plato, what gives me the right to call this a tree, and this a tree, and this a tree, and that a tree, huh? Say it again, says Plato. Aristotle says, Plato, uh, we started off with a question. The question was, what gave me the right to call these two things a tree? Or what gives me the right to call Jack and Jill both human? And Plato, you told me the answer. You told me the answer was, we get to call this a tree and this a tree because they both imitate the perfect tree. But then what gives me the right to call the perfect tree a tree? Hmm, Plato? You say they imitate yet another tree. Well, then what gives me the right to call that one a tree? Oh, oh, do they all have to imitate yet another form of a tree? This one? They're all imitating that one? Huh? Huh? Oh. This was what was, became known as Aristotle's third tree argument. The third tree argument. I'll, I'll, I'll um, explain the third tree argument, if you'd like, using logic. That stuff we talked about way back at the beginning of the course. Aristotle showed that Plato's theory of forms can be um, explained using three statements. But those three statements form a set. And the set, it turns out, is inconsistent. Go back and look at your notes if you don't know what it means. You ready for the statements? I'm just going to say them out loud here. You might want to slow down the recording. You might want to play this twice here. Statement number one. Anytime individuals A, B, and C share a name or an essence, like human, like tree, it's because they're all imitating the perfect form of a tree. They're all, imita they're all imitating the perfect form of the thing that they're named. I'll say that statement again, okay? Anytime multiple individuals have the same name, it's because they're all imitating a perfect form. Anytime multiple individuals have the same name, it's because they're imitating the form of the thing that they're named after. Okay, the reason Jack and Jill, that's an individual A and an individual B, the reason they share the name human Okay, not the name Jack, not the name Jill, the, the title human. It's because they're both imitating the form of a human. That's statement number one. Statement number two is uh, 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 every form is itself an instance. Okay, the perfect human, the form of a human is a human. The form of a tree is a tree. Otherwise, how would we have explained why Jack and Jill are both humans, or why that and that are both trees, right? So there's two statements so far, and they're consistent. So far, they're consistent. Anytime individuals A, B, C share a name, it's because they're both all imitating the form of the thing they're named after. Statement two, every form is itself an instance of the thing it's named after. Every the form of a human is a human, the form of a tree is a tree. Third statement, nothing imitates itself. Okay, the third statement is just, it's, it's, it's what we call an analytic truth. If you understand what the words mean, you see it. I can't do an imitation of Kovach. I can do an imitation of Christopher Lloyd. You remember that actor, Christopher Lloyd? What does the yellow light mean? There's my Christopher Lloyd impression. <laughs> But I can't do an imitation of Kovach, right? You can't do an imitation of yourself. A form cannot imitate itself. These three statements, any two of them can be true, but they cannot all three be true at the same time. That's the gist of Aristotle's third tree argument. I'll give you the statements one more time here. Statement number one, anytime multiple individuals share a name, like human, like tree, it's because they're all imitating the form of whatever it is that they share a name of. Two, every form is itself an individual instance of what it's named. The form of a tree is a tree, for example. Statement number three, maybe the easiest of them. 
Nothing imitates itself. That don't make no sense. Well, um, you can write out these statements for yourself and look at them. I, I hope that you can see why they can't all be true at the same time. Uh, something has to give. Any two of them can be true, but not all three. This is what Aristotle was getting at with the third tree argument. You say tree number one and tree number two are both called trees because they imitate the form of a tree. Well, if the form of a tree is itself the perfect tree, well, then it is a tree. What gives me the right to call it a tree? If the reason we call things trees is because they imitate the form of a tree, well, then what makes the form of a tree a tree? It must imitate yet another form. And it goes on. this goes on infinitely. You'll never get to an end. And if you never get to an end, you've never actually answered the question, what gives me the right to call Jack and Jill both humans? Thus, Aristotle left Plato's school. This lecture is brought to you by Diet Pepsi. Aristotle left Plato's school when he was probably in his early 30s, set up his own school. And Aristotle's theory to replace Plato's, the, the foundational um, doctrine, if you will, the foundational idea of everything Aristotle um, came up with after he left Plato's school is substances. Substance becomes the focal, um, the center of all of Aristotle's philosophical theories. The universe, said Aristotle, is made up of substances. What is a substance? It's not, you know, uh, you can't have like a, a, it's not like a bottle of icky, unidentified stuff or something like that. Like you said, yeah, what's that substance on the floor? No, it's not like that. A substance here is just an individual that you cannot say of something else, but which you say other things of. I'll say it again. A substance is an individual which you don't say of other things, but which you say other things of. That saying other things, is that a little confusing for you? Let me explain it. Um, my cat, Mr. Whiskers, she's a substance. On the other hand, furry. Furry is not a substance. Furry is something I say of Mr. Whiskers. I say Mr. Whiskers is furry. But I don't say Mr. Whiskers of other things, the way I say furry of things. So Aristotle said the universe is populated with substances, like me, like you, like that tree over there, Mr. Whiskers, uh, the Loch Ness Monster, if there is one. These are all substances. What else is there? Aristotle said, what else is there? There's nine ways that substances can be. There's nine ways that we can talk about substances. And this will exhaust the universe once we understand these ten things, substance and the nine ways they can be. Well, what are the nine ways Mr. Whiskers can be? They're called the accidents. So this is philosophical terminology that we get from Aristotle. And you'll see it used all through the history of philosophy, even to this very day. People will talk about substances and their accidents. So here's some examples of accidents. I'm not going to make you memorize the list of accidents. I won't even uh, ask you on the exam uh, for a list of accidents, although I might ask you questions about the distinction between substance and accident. Um, but Mr. Whiskers, well, she's cuddly. That's an accident. She's cuddly. Notice that accidents can change without changing what the substance is. If Mr. Whiskers stopped being cuddly, she's still a kitty cat. All of her accidents can change, but she'll still be a kitty cat. That's what makes Mr. Whiskers a substance. Mr. Whiskers is cuddly. She's nine pounds. She's alive in 2021. She's living in Los Angeles. She's sitting on my bed. She's purring. She's getting bathed by the sun. These are all examples of accidents. She's running. She's purring. Anything that you say about a substance is an accident. Okay? So Aristotle's theory is that the world is made up of substances and accidents. Well, uh, how about if I go a little bit... I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about Aristotle here, since we've got a little bit of time. Um, 
if you want, I mean, really, if you wanted to stop now, I mean, from this lecture, from this lecture, if you can understand Aristotle's third tree argument, you're going to be in great shape, really, because I'm going to go over substance and accident again in the, in the next lecture. Uh, um, but let me tell you what substances are made of. Aristotle thought, thought the next thing for us to do in our intellectual journey, and what is Aristotle trying to do here? Organize his beliefs. Aristotle had a grand project to organize beliefs about the whole universe, right? He did a lot of biology and zoology and all kinds of things. But his philosophy, at the very beginning, he set out some philosophy that would help him organize his beliefs. And it begins with the recognition of substance and accident. You see, how that helps him organize his beliefs, you'd have to read a lot more Aristotle. You take a whole course on Aristotle and you start to see how these things have organizational power through his whole system of thought. That's right, Aristotle was also a system builder. I talk about systems in the Plato's Republic lecture. Um, so Aristotle uh, uh, asks about substance, and he says substance has to be understood in, uh, as, as um, being built, so to speak, not physically built. So here we're again, we're, we're treading our feet into something called metaphysics. We start by observing a world of substances, and then we start asking about how, what is a substance? Can we say anything more about substance? Aristotle says yes. But to understand it, we, we, we're starting to walk into metaphysics. Substances are composed of matter, that's the physical part, and form, not Plato's form, but organizational form. In other words, consider a, a paradigm example here, a statue. You've all seen um, the statue of um, Iwo Jima. You know, the statue of those um, statue that was made at the end of World War II of the, of the soldiers propping up an American flag on the, on the island of Iwo Jima. Okay, what is the material or the matter of that statue? I think it's bronze, probably mostly bronze, right? The matter is, when we're talking about matter, we're talking about the physical stuff, the stuff of which something is made. But it's not just bronze. If we just went there and said, look at that bronze, we would have missed something. Right? And bronze, you can do a lot of other things with bronze. This bronze, this clump of matter, is formed as a statue. Substances are composed, they're made of matter and form. Substances are just material, it's just matter, organized to do certain things. Mr. Whiskers, what is she? She's matter, she's physical stuff, organized to be a meow, 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 purr, purr, purr critter. I am physical stuff, I'm matter, organized to be a speaking, thinking human being. What's interesting is that um, physicists are discovering, right, at the material level, at the material level, at the physical level, when you look closely enough, you start to lose the ability to, to distinguish between things between you, me, Mr. Whiskers, the statue of Iwo Jima, the moon, a rat, a flower, a tree, etc. You look at those things from the, through the lens of quantum physics, and it all is just made up of subatomic particles. They call them quarks. Then quarks appear to be made of something called strings, if string theory turns out to be true. It's a very uh, elaborate theory. But that's the physical stuff. If you ask what I am, I'm just, uh, at the physical level, at the material level, I'm just quarks and strings and electrons and that kind of stuff. I'm no different from Mr. Whiskers at that material, physical level. What a quantum physicist finds in me when they study me is pretty much what they'll find in Mr. Whiskers. So am I different from Mr. Whiskers? Aristotle thought so. Aristotle thought the difference between me and Mr. Whiskers is, yes, we're both made up of some basic matter stuff, but my basic matter stuff is organized to do something differently from her basic matter stuff. And that's where the essences get found. 
essences are found in how matter gets organized. So where Plato wanted to thingify essences and make them separate things, separate from individual trees, and ran into the third tree argument, Aristotle returned the essences to Earth. Aristotle returned essences to the planet Earth. He put them, well, not to the planet Earth, he returned them to, to the universe, I should say. Aristotle brought the essences back down to, to, to the, the level of reality that you and I engage it with. <clears throat> the essence of Mr. Whiskers and of trees and of you and me isn't to be found in a separate world, a, a world of forms. It's rather in how the matter gets organized. It's in what the matter is organized to do. When matter is organized to be a meow, 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 purr, purr, purr critter, then the essence of the thing is a cat, because that's how it's formed. When the matter gets organized to be a thinking, speaking human being, well, then the essence is humanity, because my matter has been formed to do human stuff. So this is Aristotle's theory of substance. It's his theory of matter and form. <clears throat> Aristotle's theory of matter and form has a fancy philosophy name, hylomorphism. I'll say it again because it was fun. Hylomorphism. Uh, but if you're having a hard, hylo is just a Greek word that means matter. So you, and, and morph is a word that means form. You could just call this theory matter and formism if you want. Or if you want to impress your friends who are philosophy majors and minors, you'll remember to call it hylomorphism. H-L-Y-O-M-O-R-P-H-I-S-M. And it forms the foundation, the bedrock of everything else Aristotle had to say. So, in our next lecture, we'll look at how Aristotle applies his theory of matter and form to living things, and most specifically, how he applies them to living human beings like you and me. See you next time.